Well, hello, everyone, and welcome back to this very new episode of the Josie Dumont podcast. I'm your coach and host, Josie, and today I'm joined by a fellow podcaster, but also ex-executive who turned leadership coach, Shah Banerjee. Welcome to the pod. So good to be here, Josie. I'm so happy to have you. Like, honestly, I can't wait to dive into this conversation with you because not only, obviously, do you have like a hell of a lot of experience in the leadership space, but you must also know all of the best books, thanks to your podcast, that will help some of the listeners to become a better leader. So I will definitely ask you for some recommendations to add onto my reading list as well. But before we dive in, I'd love to hear your side of the story. Like, how did you turn leadership coach? What is your journey that got you to where we are today? Yeah. Uh, so great question. I started my career in the consulting world and I spent my time doing that and being entrepreneurial in a consulting world. I didn't realize that I had an affinity to creating and pulling mm. things together and building things from scratch. And, you know, that, like there were some hints, but I wasn't paying attention. Um, and so I started paying more attention to what drove me and what got me excited. And so that's when an I got myself into the startup world, into building and growing, um, and I was responsible for revenue. And so in my previous experience, I was the head of sales at a company that grew very quickly. And in my time there, I talked a lot about revenue, right? As, as you do with numbers and growth and projections, like the bottom line was always on everybody's mind. Mm -hmm. But the secret that I got to was that behind revenue were people. And when I spent my time developing people and really getting into the nooks and crannies of what brings people's best traits forward and how can they really like shine with their full resonance, that's when the consequence of all of that work resulted in the revenue. And so I realized that there was this discrepancy between what everybody wants to talk about and what they should be or they need to talk about, you know, in order <laughs> to serve that. And so, you know, I did that and it was I did that really, really well for a very long time. And I realized that the thing that I was doing really, really well was the thing that I needed to develop further. And so that was the start of my own leadership development practices. And so today we, so my company is called Access Plus Leaders and we deliver experiential and highly valuable creative leadership development programs that result in personal transformation and that lead to an organizational wow feeling by the end of it. Um, and so we partner with organizations to work with people at the executive level, at the mid-manager level, and it's all about bringing in the right practices and the right workshops and trainings to ensure that you're getting at the heart of what true, uh, what great leadership development actually feels like. And so that's what I mean, but, and I say like, we do it creatively mm -hmm. and we do it in a way that you will remember. So it's not boring PowerPoint presentations. It's experiential. It's live. It's creative. You feel it, you live it. And then you bring that to the work that you're doing. Mm, I love that. And I also love that you mentioned you're basically tapping into your zone of genius, right? As you figure it out what you're really good at and that you wanted to develop the, that further in order to create this company that now helps others as well. Yeah. I was recently talking to somebody about that, which is everybody's got the zone of genius. Everybody's got yeah. the thing that they know to do really well or have an inkling that there is something special here. And, you know, what happens when we just start paying more attention? I also feel that it's it's got to be said that, you, you know, there's an element of um, good luck mm -hmm. <laughs> associated with being able to spend the time discovering what your zone of genius is and then going deeper. So I am very lucky and grateful for everything that's kind of fit in the right places for me to be able to spend this time in the way that I am. Oh, 
I would also say, though, all the decisions you made, all the choices you made, they got you to this point that you can do that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm. What do you feel like? Do, do you feel like there's like a difference between the leaders in corporate versus maybe you as you how you show up as an entrepreneur? Do you feel like there are some differences in terms of like leading a business versus working for a business as a leader? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, I think that there is a distinctive feeling of what it feels like to be a leader from the corporate space versus when you're leading your own life and your own mm -hmm. business within. And what I mean by that is like, I, I get the sense when I'm in corporate spaces, I get the overall sense that there's this, you're leading from the outside in. But there are all these rules and these beliefs that everyone else holds true that you then try to adopt and then make it work for you within. So that's what I mean about you lead from the outside in. Mm -hmm. And that's distinctively different from when you are building your own thing and you're doing it by yourself, I feel like there is this push and this call to lead from inside out. And that can feel completely different. Not to say that organized people who work in organizations don't lead from inside out. In fact, mm -hmm. the ones that do, you know, that they're the ones that everybody wants to work for, right? <laughs> yes, like they're absolutely. the ones that they're like, they're like, just the coolest, most amazing, you know, have the wildest stories. And so I feel like that flip feels very real in both of those spaces. Um, and it's, I think, a very simple way of just kind of explaining, I think, what the overall differences feel like. Mm, I absolutely love that. I mean, obviously, you already mentioned that it's those people you want to follow who are leading from the inside out, also in corporates, yeah. right? Those are the ones who are authentic, that are true to themselves, to their values, who tap into their own zone of genius and who do not conform actually everything that everybody else is telling them to do so. Yeah. How would you describe maybe that balance act actually of being authentic and leading from inside out versus having maybe even that pressure or that culture in that company that you are working for that might force you almost to conform into something you're not? Mm -hmm. In my practice, talk about access plus leaders and access is actually an acronym. And mm -hmm. so part of why I wanted to come up with a framework for leadership is to address that specific question. Before I got into the development of this company, I ran a big R&D project and I interviewed a lot of people with the end goal of understanding what do others understand about leadership? And the answers were wild. Yeah. You know, the, yeah. And so the questions that I would ask is like, you know, what's leadership to you? Like, how would you define it? Um, there was a big percentage of the participants who said, Ooh, can we come back to that question? Mm -hmm. Like, can you ask me after? Like, let's go, let's, let's answer a, an easier question. Um, some refused to answer completely. And, uh, and then, and then for another large majority of people, leadership was all about the person in power. I have to listen to my boss and mm. therefore they are the leader. So it was, it was very interesting to me, the uh, misunderstanding and the misconception of what leadership is and where you stand relative to this bubble called leadership. And so I want to dive into what Access Plus actually stands for, and it mm -hmm. represents this framework for leadership. Um, and it stands for adaptability, i.e., you know, how we shift and move mm -hmm. relative to the spaces that we occupy. Because you can't be the one person to everybody at all times. Like, it, it, you know, in relationship to people, adaptability is crucial. In relationship to problems, adaptability is essential. 
So adaptability at large becomes this very important core tenet of, of really great leaders. The second one is on communication. So A-C-C-E-S-S plus um, communication, essential, essential to be able to communicate, not just words. I feel like that's another common misunderstanding of like a leader is somebody who can speak really well and they can give direction. Yes. And the listening. Yes. Oh, and yes. the silence. Yes. And the body language, right? Like there's so much about communication that is unseen, unheard, that also needs to be studied. And so communication is essential. Then the next C is about confidence. Um, and, you know, the the confidence with which you exude decisions that need to be made or indecisions, right? Like that's the other thing about confidence isn't I know everything at all times. Yeah, confidence is also I'm not sure how this is going to go. Yes. But I trust I trust who I'm going to be. I trust the you. I trust the relationship that we get. Like, I know with clarity and confidence that we will figure it out. And that I may not have the answers. And I know that that's not what you're looking for. So confidence. The E is all on execution. Because at the end of the day, it's lofty goals or uh, dreams <laughs> that don't get realized. <laughs> but execution is really where rubber hits the road and you can get 100% out of yeah totally right so execution's um essential then there's s which is self awareness <clears throat> huge huge for leaders you know and this is where i see the role of a lot of uh, executive coaches come in because you can't know the thing about you that you don't know and self awareness is being open to the fact that everyone's got blind spots and everyone deserves and needs to explore what they may be and how they may be impacting the rest of you. Um, the last S is about service, which is about giving. All right. There's so much about leaders that's all about in service of others mm. and the giving nature with which you have to, you know, you have to, you can't go it alone. That's not it's not going to work. It's going to be you and the team of you. Um, so service is huge. And then the plus actually symbolizes creation and belonging, mm -hmm. right? Like yes. amazing leaders need to know how to create belonging, spaces of belonging. You, know, you talked about culture and you talked about, well, how do you prevent that culture from seeping in or making you change belonging? You create create spaces that are safe, that are psychologically safe, physically safe, whatever it may be. Um, and how do you get others to feel like I belong here? That's such an amazing framework. And especially the pieces around like obviously confidence, execution, but also self-awareness and service are the ones that stand out the most for me. Mm -hmm. Because one confidence, obviously, it's all about self-trust. It's trusting that you can deal with the tough stuff. Like you can work through the challenges you're facing. You can deal with the mistakes you make in a confident way that is not detrimental to you or your business or the company, but actually it supports you on making progress and learning from it and also helping then the team later on to not make that same mistake again. Yeah. And the self-awareness piece I love especially because that's something I always, always ponder on. Like, I feel like I literally have a broken record. I'm always like, it starts from within. It starts with self-awareness. Even if you don't want to hear that, that's yeah. just what it is. Change always starts from within and how you know yourself, how you know your triggers, but also obviously, for example, your zone of genius, what you can do well, where you might need to improve and stuff. Doesn't mean you need to know everything or that you need to become the ultimate human being. But self-awareness, as you say, will shed light on those blind spots that we all have. It's just what makes us human in the end. And the execution part is so crucial because if we don't take action towards what we want to achieve, um, then we will just remain at the same place. And even better, if you then can obviously take action that is also of service to others and have an impact not only on bettering your own life, right? But also 
bettering the life of others or making this whole world a better place. Absolutely. And also what you said in terms of the um, communication piece, as you're a coach now as well, right? You're certified too. You know about the listening levels. Yeah. How would you go about teaching maybe even a leader who is not good at listening at all, who just is like, I'm delegating, delegating, delegating. How would you teach them those listening skills so they can take them on board and actually create a better bond, but also psychological safety with their team because they start listening to them instead of just talking at them? Several. There's several, several strategies that I, uh, that I implement. One of them is that you're not allowed to talk, that you've got to go to a high stakes meeting and you yes. can't, actually sure. can't talk like that's it. Right. Because you know about the hippo, the highest paid person's opinion is the one that steers the ship. And sadly, when you're always talking, you aren't really opening up the team to the collective intelligence of the group, right? And so what happens when you force yourself, and I say force because this is just one tactic of somebody who can't necessarily let go of the control. So there's almost got to be this like other version of this extreme action, which is force yourself to not speak. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And while you're there, you're the only thing that you can do that you're allowed to do is listen. Yeah. And we talked about levels of listening. So that's one example, but you know, the other example for levels of listening is, um, and just for anyone who's kind of not clear on what this means, what do you mean level of listening? Yeah. There's, there's three versions of there's three levels to listening. The level of listening that most people occupy is level one. Yeah. Where when you're having a conversation with somebody, you're mentally checking in to in in your own facilities, like in your own brainwaves to be like, how am I going to respond? How does this make sense to me? What am I going to say next? Like, I'm going to just feed right into my brain and be ready for when it's my turn to speak next. That's level one. And all of us spend time here, right? This is very, very common. Level two is, uh, you know, if you can imagine um, listening with your heart open to connect to another person. And the way that I describe this form of listening is this form of listening is having no attachment to the conversation that's going to happen. And what I mean by mm. that often is when you're in level one, you want to steer and you want to direct the conversation. That's why you're going into your brain to say like, I'm going to tell you about this story. That's right. It's because you want to steer in that direction. And in level two, you have this commitment of, I'm not sure if my opinion is going to be changed today. I'm not sure what the result of this conversation is going to be like. And mm -hmm. I'm open to be in this journey. And as a consequence to that attitude shift, you're not paying attention to the story that you need to tell, but rather you're, you're more zoomed into the stories that others are sharing, you know, and an experiential thing, by the way, that I lead um, groups of people to do to tap into level two is when the other person is talking mm -hmm. is to pay attention to their eyes and find details yes. in another person's face. You know, as soon as you feel like you're going into level one and thinking about what you're going to say and how you're going to respond, like zoom right back into that human, because you want to make sure that the difference between level one, where it's just you, 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 you to level two, which is like this heart centered connection to this other person. Yeah. And level three is, is, you know, a bit more mystical than that. Like there's this energy management, there's this, you know, this sensing, this feeling, um, and that becomes a lot more experiential in groups too. And there's, you know, a few exercises that can help you tap into the collective wisdom that happens mm. in these. Spaces. And like I said, there's more like this ethereal energy space. Um, but hopefully that gives you a good idea of like what level one, level two, and level three distinctively feels like. 
Yes, absolutely. And I, I heard like the other day, a tip for level two listening yeah. is to obviously not like obsessively, but to try count how often the other person is blinking. Oh, or to be like super aware of like how how often the other person is blinking, just so you really stay focused on them, their facial expressions, and like what's going on as well. But yeah. obviously not to a degree where you just like, yeah, okay, yeah, yeah, you're yeah, blinking. Yeah. <laughs> I think I think the essence of level two is what happens if you're just more curious about the other person. Yes. And I think that's what these techniques about, like, look into the eyes and count the number of blinks. I think it all helps you land at what happens if you're just right here, right now, getting curious about the way that their tone twitched a bit, that when they said that word, there was a bit of a pause or a hesitation. What was behind that? You know, and I think staying in that zone of curiosity versus level one, which I feel is almost the zone of judgment. Yes. Right? Yeah. Yes, totally agree. Um, what I also wanted to add on to the third level is to take into account surroundings mm -hmm. of the other person because everything, like especially I feel like in the Zoom world, right, in this virtual world, this is even more important because we only see like this little square, but even with this little square, there's like so much going on for the other person. So for you, you have the dog in your background, maybe she's barking or like something else is happening. Right. And that might distract you, but in that moment, it can also offer other insights or other perspectives and messages. Absolutely. Yeah. Great, great addition on the surroundings and including the surroundings of the other person in person. It feels easier to do that. You're oh, right. Yeah. Because you're sharing that environment, but in our digital world, it takes some conscious and mindful practice to do that. It mm -hmm. does. It really does. Would you say like there are some other experiential, maybe also tips that you would give someone to also be more authentic to express themselves as a leader if we go back to the not conforming, but truly leading inside out, even in the corporate space. Yeah, I think it's a, it's a game of practice. It's a game of practice, especially if you're newer to this decision that you've made of I'm going to be an authentic leader. It, it takes practice and it takes intention setting and, um, and, and before you, you, you become a master at it as you know, as with any sport, like you've got to keep up the reps. Mm -hmm. And um, I mean, I would say the biggest flex, the biggest tip that you can have is to work with somebody who holds you accountable to that standard. And this is why I think working with leadership coaches and executive coaches are like the game change. You know, you can, you can visibly see <laughs> the difference of a leader who's not had any coach and then mm. starts working with a coach, you can see the shift in energy, dynamics, intention, power. There is truly transformation that is visible because you're not just kind of like gradually. This is like step level, like not incremental, but like big step change of differences that you see as humans explore what growth and transformation and their own authentic voice can feel like as they work with a leadership coach. So that would be the biggest one, mm -hmm. Josie. And then, I mean, there's, there's several that, you know, keep everything alive. It, that's another mm. way I like to say mm -hmm. it is like, you know, you do this work and you self-discover, but there's also ways in which you keep it alive. Um, the thing that I was talking about at the start of this conversation, which is how is it to lead from inside out? I would say that that's the aliveness of the inside is the practice that you've got to make sure you're not overlooking. Mm. Um, you know, and these, I, I've seen people do it in several different ways. Like there is the good morning mirror technique where you're brushing your teeth and you look at yourself in the mirror and you say out loud who it is that you want to be today. Oh, I love that. You say out loud, you see yourself saying it, you hear your own voice, 
And to me, this is like a different version of visualization that's so practical and grounded and so real in the consequences of what happens after. And then there are others who like journaling or typing. And I I say, yeah, yeah, typing is a big one. So like, that's another way in which you're making conscious decisions every Mm -hmm. single day that remind you of the the work that you're keeping alive and work with a coach i would say that would be, <laughs> those would be my, my three work with work the with coach. coach well yeah i mean because some of these tactics and strategies that i provided with the mirror and the journaling those are just strategies and tactics they may not work for you but when you work with somebody who gets to you know figure out some of your Uh, the ways in which you prefer to work, the ways in which you're motivated to work, like what are your, all of the things about you get factored into the game plan. Like the leadership development plan of you is customized to you. And that, that happens when you work with somebody one-to-one. Absolutely. I actually have like such a beautiful story with a client as well, where she came in and she was like, she wants to know how she can show up as a as a leader how she can show up authentically and she had no clue as to what her leadership style was and when we start, started talking about it at first she was literally like she was literally slouching she was yeah. playing small she was like just like decreasing <laughs> all the time she was just shrinking and it was all due to those mindset blocks those limiting beliefs she was overthinking over analyzing fearing the judgment of others And as we work through it and she managed to like release them through coaching, she then suddenly like grew taller again and like way more confident. She started to like radiate incredible energy. And we then talked through how she actually does want to show up as a leader. And we listed all those qualities and we listed all the examples where she already like had these qualities as well in her life. Uh, yeah, Yeah, where she was already doing that, I mean. But then also to find action steps where she can continue getting this proof of she actually is already the leader she is biased to be. And I also love how you describe that part with the visualization thing, because that might not work for everybody. And for her, what actually did work was to just have like an orange flower as a reminder. And that's now like stuck to her laptop every day so she can see it every day as a visual reminder of how she wants to show up as a leader Mm -hmm. and yeah as you say like working with a coach it can really just shed the light on those things where you might be holding yourself back and create that self-awareness with the mirror like we literally hold just the mirror up and be like this is you (laughs) this is what you're doing let's change it up and to have someone also to hold that holds you accountable to get there Like you're not alone in all of this. And that's why I feel like this profession as a leadership coach is so, so, so important because it not only affects the leader or the person, but also the employees, their team and everything else. Absolutely. I love the orange flower visual. Um, There's several examples of what people can do. I've seen specific rings. Yes, bracelets. Uh, there, there was one talk of a tattoo, <laughs> right? And so like, these are like visual cue reminders, yep. um, but it may not work for you. Like, and, and there's, and there's like a million others. <laughs> That's so true. Actually, I have like loads of tattoos as reminders Oh, nice for several things. <laughs> oh, we should get into that after. Oh, yeah, yeah, definitely. (laughs) Like some of them are also Harry Potter inspired, but that's then for your podcast. (laughs) That's so fun. Okay, great. Can't wait. (laughs) Yes. Um, I also wanted to ask you, actually, because obviously on your podcast, right, you interview loads of people about their favorite books. So this is two questions in one. What are your favorite lessons you learned as well as what are your top books that you would recommend? Favorite lessons and top books. Okay, so the podcast that I have is called Books That Built Me. And uh, it's a conversational interview style about a 
a leader in whatever space they have, and a book that they feel has truly changed the game for them. So we don't talk necessarily about the entire book. Sometimes we get into it, but most often the conversations are about stories that happened as a consequence of reading this book or the evolution of them. And so um, to me, I, I love these types of conversations because I get to see the learning and growth that has happened in another human. Um, and I feel like sometimes that moves me more than what the lesson on the page mm -hmm. is, you know, um, like a lesson on the page could be, be a good person, but somebody's story of what they did and how they transformed the lives of other kids around them. Like that to me is the story and the lesson that I will lean into. So that's the premise behind the, the podcast. Um, the first question about lessons and the lessons that I have learned that one's very tough because I feel that I have learned something in every single book, mm -hmm. in every single book. I can't say that there's a single book that's not taught me something. And that's hard for me to get into because I'm not sure. I'm not sure which one to dive into, but if you have a specific book, um, I'm happy to sort of zoom in there. Okay, let's do Atomic Habits because that's one of my favorite go-tos. Yeah, Atomic Habits, um, I have not yet released the episode um, of the interview that I have for Atomic Habits just yet. There were some production quality issues, unfortunately. Oh. I know, but that book is transformational, right? Like that book is all about incremental shifts. I think the bottom line for me for that book was don't let yourself work harder than you have to. Like he never ever once said that, but that was my takeaway. And by, by that, I mean, he says, you know, when you want to shift, make your supporting environment be this, be the environment that you need instead of constantly resisting the current environment yes. and therefore working harder and harder and harder to get to a new habit because it's already hard enough. Yes. <laughs> That's it's so already true. hard enough. Like get your systems, your support and your surroundings to the optimal state that supports the new habit instead of keeping everything exactly the same and working 10x, wasting energy because mm. that is not going to be sustainable. Do you remember that? That? Part of the book? Yeah. Yes. Yes. And it's something I actually like practice consistently every day, literally myself. And yeah. something I have been really honing into when I was writing my own book. I was yeah. like, okay, I need to set myself up for success. What do I need to achieve that? And I needed a consistent writing practice that I would stick to every workday. So I literally blocked out something in my calendar and I made the promise to myself, I will show up to this writing session. I will not skip it. So any meetings, any calls that would fall into that window, I would cancel. I would not go there. I would do my writing instead. And I also called on board um, five better readers who were expecting a chapter from me every single week. So I had to keep on writing to provide them, obviously, with the material so they could read it and give me feedback. And just that alone already helped me to just be like, okay, I got to show up. I got to do it. And at the same time, despite me setting like a window of 60 minutes, I would say even if I write one sentence this day, I would sit the 60 minutes there, but I would, yeah. I would still show up. I would still do the thing. So yeah. that's definitely something I learned from that book that helped me yeah. to write my book yeah. within like 40 days only. Yeah. I'll give you, I'll give you another example. This was a conversation I had with my brother about mm. his decision to want to read more. He's already an avid reader, but he wanted to make it more of a conscious practice in his day every single day. Mm -hmm. And you'll you'll see challenges like the 90 challenge where you're supposed to read 10 pages a day, work out two times, you know. And so there's this idea that in order to be a reader, you measure reading through the number of pages you put in. 
Okay. Here, and here's a great example of make your environment work for you as you take on this new challenge of wanting to be uh, an avid reader on the app on like every single day. Mm-hmm. And so instead of having the rule be, I need to read 10 pages a day or I won't make it. He flipped it to say, from this time to this time, I'm going to give myself 30 minutes to read a book. And if I cover 10 pages, great. If I cover one line, great. But I will not judge myself for how much I read in the 30 minutes. 30 minutes is the start of the timer and the end of the timer. And I will enjoy the process of reading. Mm. And I feel like that then allows for for your day to not be overtaken by this one to do on your mind. Because you can actually spend two hours reading 10 pages if your mind is wandering or if you're distracted or if you're not actually in the moment. And so that is actually not a good use of time more than I'm going to do what I can do being fully present for 30 minutes and see what that and see what happens there. And then whatever happens, I get to close my book and call myself a reader. Exactly. exactly. I get to call myself a reader. And that's the identity part, obviously, yeah. James Clear is also uh, oh, writing about, right? Like yeah. that you identify as the person who is doing that as an author, as a reader, as a gym rat, as a leader, whatever it is. Yeah. The identity is another um, piece of the, his whole thing about, you know, when you, when you commit to doing something, there's a difference between committing to doing something versus deciding the identity of you. And as a consequence, those actions flow. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So good. It's a sweet part. <laughs> <laughs> Your second question was about the books that I would recommend. So before we hit record, I had to go over to my little library there and mm-hmm. really think about which ones I wanted to I wanted to share with everybody. So I, I landed on three that I think mm-hmm. are are game changing. And this is for the answer to this question is about these are the books that will help you become a better leader. OK, so the first one that I have is uh, The Four Agreements, mm. The Four Agreements. This is by Don Miguel Ruiz. And um, this book I read in an afternoon and proceeded to send it to people that I love. Oh, really? It's transformational. Transformational. We talked about um, we talked about identity and we talked about decisions that you make as a consequence of identity. This book taps into that in a yeah. really big way. Yeah. Um, so. I will leave that with you. The Four Agreements, Don Miguel Ruiz. The second one that I have is um, Mindset by mm. Carol Dweck. Have you have you read this one? I haven't read it yet. It's on my list, actually. Yeah, I've read it many times now. And every time I read it, I'm reminded of a new lesson. And, it, you know, I mean, the book, the title gives it away, right? It's like the, the human psychology. Um, how can we live? our full to our fullest potential by switching up the way that we think um growth mindset versus fixed mindset and the examples in this book make it more i think more tangible mm, uh, more relatable. for you more relatable absolutely so and by the way like this is not just for people in the business world if you're a parent this is huge for you. if you're a teacher or if you're a kid in a schooling system you'll see So many of these examples make so much sense. And then relationships too. So mindset's a big one. Um, And then the last book that I have here on leadership, I mean, I kind of talked about my framework and how execution is is so key. I feel like this book, I come back to it. I come back to it often. It's The Four Disciplines of Execution um, by Sean Covey. And um, it is a game change when it comes to thinking about what goals get met versus what goals don't. So it redefines goals. Like, I mean, you know, you know, the smart goals that are specific, measurable, you know, realistic, all of that stuff. Um, This switches it up to get you thinking about defining a goal 
that isn't as task e but more mm. heart centered like why does this mm. matter yeah. that needs to be part of the goal they call it a yes. wildly important goal um and then and then it talks about well how do you know that you're successful that's a different topic than what are you doing to be successful and these are some measures and so he defines lead measures and lag measures and this book i mean <laughs> funny story i started reading it at 11 p.m. thinking okay i'm just going to it's going to be a boring business book and i'm going to mm-hmm. fall asleep after a few pages <laughs> i was up until 4 a.m. no reading way. this book yep yeah. and i was wide awake all the thoughts <laughs> brimming in my mind yeah. And I ran down to my kitchen because I ha- we have this little whiteboard on my kitchen. And I started whiteboarding some of these thoughts that I was At 4 a.m. At 4 a.m. <laughs> so this book, and I have bought it for so many people. Uh, game change. Game change book. Those oh, my gosh. Okay, right. I have like, I need to get these books. <laughs> <laughs> Especially the first one. I've literally never heard of it. The other oh, two man. I have heard of but not the four agreements. So I need to, I need to get like a big order. <laughs> I, I, I interviewed somebody um, about this book on my mm-hmm. podcast and my guest has purchased this book so many times that he was blacklisted from Amazon. No yeah. way. I'm, I'm not joking. So and he, I think he said like 200 plus times. What? Yeah. Yeah. This is to a gift good, to others. To gift to others. Holy. You know, you know, a book is good. If you when, gift it. <laughs> if you gift it. Exactly. Yeah. That's so true. Oh my gosh. Okay. Literally, right after this episode, I will go to Amazon and order that book. <laughs> You'll read it in no time. It's such a quick read and it's like, it changes. It changes things. I love that. Of oh course. I actually I have wait. it. I actually have it written down on my wall. Yeah. As a reminder to me. Yeah. 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 It's a good book. I love that. <laughs> oh my gosh. I love that so much. I I love this whole conversation. I feel like I could talk to you for way longer, but we are coming to the last segment mm-hmm. of the show, if you're ready. So this will be like a fire round of questions, okay. which you can answer in like one short word or short sentence only. Okay. But before we do so, please tell me a number between one to 10. Oh, five. Okay, I will ask you five questions. <laughs> oh my gosh, that's what this is about. <laughs> okay, let's do it. Let's do it. Okay, so first question. What is the Sha way of living and leading your best life? The Sha way. Oh, I can't have so many words. Got it. <laughs> Gratitude and love. I love that. Gratitude and love. Okay, question number two. When shit hits the fan, what do you tell yourself to get through it? Snap out of it. Mm. What is your key habit for success? Reflection. Very good. Uh, What advice would you love to give the listeners? About what? About anything. Show your love more unapologetically. That's a good one. What is the theme song of your life? Oh, gosh. (laughs) You stumped me on that one. (laughs) I have a playlist. I don't know. I have a motivational, inspirational playlist. (laughs) Is there like one song that that came up in your YouTube or Spotify like year roundup where you were like, okay, that's your number one song? Oh gosh, you really got me on that one. <laughs> I don't know. I'm a cra- I'm a crazy EDM person. So I listen Ooh. to uh, electronic dance music and I listen to remixes. So to me, I feel like that just marries high energy music with like some soulful love, you know, it just, Mm. yeah, it just makes me groove, but I can't tell you one song, sadly. That's so okay. Actually, I'm like, 
I'm like the same because I, one, I never remember the names of the artists, nor do I remember the name of the songs. I'm like, if I play it, I know it. <laughs> yes. You know, Maya Angelou says the same thing. Like you will not remember what people say or what you will remember how they make you feel. And I feel yes. the same way about music. Yes. I'm always that person. Like let's Shazam that. Cause I want to remember it but I won't remember the title or the name, but when I hear it, I'm, t I'm transported to a feeling. Yes, exactly. It's, it's the exact same thing for me. That's so funny. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much for, first of all, powering through the questions. I think you have been the first person so far who literally nailed most of them with just one word or short sentence i thought I that was the game yeah yeah but <laughs> most people are like going on a tangent <laughs> they're like i'm so sorry like i couldn't do it in one word a short <laughs> sentence and i'm like that's okay you just did it your way i actually really love the challenge of using only a few words it's fun right it's pretty good yeah. it really gets you thinking it's like okay what's the one thing actually yeah yeah, yeah. love that thank you so much for sharing your wisdom today for sharing your expertise and also I just want to point out to all the listeners obviously I will put all your contact details into the description box so do head over and show Shah some love and connect with her and say hi tell her what you learned in the in the episode I'm sure you would love to hear that too and Absolutely. Do, 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 do. yeah I think that wraps up the episode unless you have any like last words from your side to share Just a big thank you to you, Josie. This was a fun conversation and you have this great energy and spirit. And it felt like we could keep talking for another yes. hour, actually. <laughs> so thank you for having me. Thank you for being so warm and just so welcoming. It was great to be with you. Thank you so much. It was literally the honor is all mine. It was such a pleasure. And yeah, to all the listeners again, like I see you next week with another episode and have a great day. See you soon. Bye. Bye. Also, I wanted to say like the first time I listened to your podcast, I was like, you have such a nice voice. <laughs> Thanks. Thank you. Yeah. You know, I've been told that I've had a nice voice for all my life. And last year, I just decided to do something about it. So I started a podcast and I joined a competitive singing group. <laughs>